Um, it's just great to be in this environment and have so many great ideas and to learn from such extraordinary work that's happening on the ground across all the systems that are represented here. So, so the task now is to hear from our six facilitators. Um, each of the work groups, workshops, there was conversation identifying one or two um, next steps. What are your best bets for next steps? So we're just going to go down and um, hear what has emerged from those groups, the six groups. And if there's a little bit of Q&A, we'll have Q&A if anybody has any questions. And then we'll have our list, and then we'll hand it over to Debbie and Allison to close. OK, so group A, Opportunities for Childhood Obesity Prevention with the uh, CDC, DF, and Block Grant. So uh, Kate, I think you're, you're up. A really great discussion. The the speakers represented uh, two different state perspectives. One in how to um, implement CCDBG and focus on obesity prevention in standards and QRIS, and the other one spoke a bit about learning collaboratives happening in Virginia that are helping to provide training and technical assistance on the ground. Um, I would say the three top things, the actionable items that we talked about was one to really take advantage of what states are doing in looking at their licensing and QRIS with reauthorization and to try to incorporate and push forward best practices and a set of standards that can easily be adapted into licensing. So I was personally very excited about that because as a coincidence, many of you may or may not know that the federal government recently released a voluntary set of um, standards that can be easily adapted into state licensing and QRIS. Um, it's voluntary, and there are actually 72 standards that represent the absolute basic foundations that experts believe should be in place in terms of health and safety in early care and education settings, regardless of what funding stream supports that program. And there are a number of standards that are specifically related to physical activity and healthy nutrition. So I encourage you to, to look at those standards. Another piece that came up during discussion was how important it was to link um, the required and optional health and safety trainings that are discussed in reauthorization to outcomes and to be able to show that um, there were actually impacts in terms of licensing outcomes so that folks can really see um, the evidence of what those trainings actually accomplish. Um, and then the third piece was just to really take better advantage of, of certain grant opportunities that are out there that folks may not know about. One, um, for example, is the SNAP Ed program, which provides a toolkit, but also $400 million in grant programs. Um, to fund obesity prevention, and early care and education is one of the sectors that's highlighted. All right, so I'm, I'm reporting back on an excellent uh, workshop that we had on water and other healthy beverages in early care and education settings. We have three best bets, which we believe are actionable items. We have one for policy, one for um, practice, and one for research. So our policy recommendation uh, that came out of the workshop is that all ECE policies dealing, dealing with nutrition and physical activity should exclude sugar-sweetened beverages. And by excluding the sugar-sweetened beverages, we reduce the, the uh, calories, and therefore we would move closer to the federal goals of reducing obesity. Our practice recommendation is based on lessons learned from Nemours ECELC project, and it focuses on some of the best strategies for creating change. And those are that you have to build a relationship. It's apparently just showing up and telling people what to do doesn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you have to share your perspective, but you have to understand the perspective of the provider and the parents. And you have to offer information which is clear and actionable that has steps that are practical practical so that people know what they actually have to do once they make a decision that that's what's going to work for them. And those are the messages that we learned from the Moore's 
program, and we thought those were great in terms of best bets. And our final best bet is a research recommendation, and we are recommending that there be research done on developing messaging around healthy water mm -hmm. and the importance of healthy water in ECE, mm -hmm. and we have a particular concern since the crisis in Flint has generated a lot of negative publicity about drinking water and early mm -hmm. care and education, and it's created concerns about whether people actually have healthy water that's coming out of the tap in their early care and education setting or not. So we have uh, three subcategories which we think would be important to look at in terms of researching effective messaging for healthy water and early care and education. So those are the recommendations from our water and other healthy eating in early care and education settings. So, wow. All right, so um, I was a facilitator for family engagement and we had a lot of people there. There was a lot of energy in the room and I so wish we could have carried on the conversation even further because we were generating a lot of really great ideas. I have it narrowed down to five, so I'm going to run through them kind of quickly. Um, the first one is inviting parents to trainings, such as IMIL. Um, we acknowledge that not every parent would be able to attend, but we thought that this would be an easy way to make a great investment in the community, trying to uh, cultivate some of the emerging family leaders. Um, parents who are able to attend the trainings could then go out and act as community ambassadors, um, give advice to other parents, share their stories, um, and act as positive, uh, positive deviants in the community. Number two um, is consistent messaging with parents. And this did come up a lot. I know it's come up a lot as we've been talking the last two days, having this consistent messaging. Um, just being respectful, incorporating techniques such as motivational interviewing, um, being mindful of some of those faulty assumptions that we may have. Um, we want to be able to emphasize that parents are partners, they're not just participants, that they should be in partnership and be incorporated all throughout um, the development process of some of these programs. Um, and we need to make sure that when we're talking to parents that we're framing the discussion um, around young, uh, young child brain development and discuss with parents how the changes um, that we're talking about can really benefit their family. Number three was um, modifying and taking advantage of the QRIS. So, um, and this came out of Ohio's presentation. So looking at what is already required as a family engagement activity, and then using those activities as opportunities, platforms really, um, in which we can infuse health messaging uh, and education. Number four is supporting provider staff. Um, so we want to make sure that we are acknowledging them as these critical linkages to parents, uh, recognizing the impact that they have both as a role model for kids and also as a core source of information for parents. And then lastly, uh, spread and scale success stories. And so one example that was highlighted um, during, uh, during our brainstorming session, thank you, Diane Kraft, um, is Family Fun Night program um, that she talked about where for one hour, uh, once a month, um, in a local gym, uh, you get parents together um, with the staff and they lead physical activities with families, modeling and teaching parents in a respectful way how to play with their own children. Um, and this was for all ages, so parents don't have to worry about babysitting, and they get to learn different activities that they can do with babies and preschoolers, no matter, no matter what age the children is. And then following a lot of this physical activity, um, then they would sit down and during um, the meeting part, they would have uh, nutrition talks and during meal, there was a meal afterwards. Diane, are you out there? Yes. Might be able to. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I'm reporting out on um, also another excellent workshop um, where we talked about, um, where we heard about the uh, early care and education learning um, collaboratives model, the healthy way to grow uh, model around uh, wellness policies, and then uh, farm to school or farm to ECE network. And we spent some time uh, discussing a little bit of um, how these um, programs uh, are operating through the health equity lens. And there was some interesting discussion, although not 
an action step that um, came out of that, but I, I did want to highlight that it was a it was um, a, a topic that we that we did discuss. The biggest action step that came out was um, sort of consensus around uh, that there should be a way to better uh, integrate obesity prevention, um, support for obesity prevention into the home visiting programs, and a feeling that at the federal level, anyway, that it's a little overly strict in terms of the models that um, states can use within that um, program, but that there should be a way to expand flexibility around that and to have some obesity related outcomes as, as part of that program, and that seemed like uh, a doable action step to uh, follow up on, both at the federal and, and state levels. I also wanted to note one uh, theme that came out across all of the speakers was that there was no one set intervention to be spread and scaled, and that the state and the local context really dic dictates what um, is best to do and the importance of um, the broad partnerships uh, for, for helping to figure that out. And then a third point that came out uh, around wellness policies is um, more sort of what not to do, a cautionary step. Uh, it, to, it wasn't believed to, uh, uh, a good direction to go would be to try to have um, a wellness policy model that was sort of handed down uh, to ECE providers to um, try to follow and that that wouldn't be followed and that would be shelved and how uh, other approaches that allow for uh, more input and, and choice and, and flexibility were, were going to be more successful and in terms of the implementation and there were there's been a lot of work around wellness policies, as everyone knows, in the school setting, that there's some lessons learned, and there are already some examples of, at least on the farm to school side, um, from a couple states, California and Hawaii, mentioned specifically that um, have incorporated, at least for this, the K through 12 system, have included farm to school in, into, uh, in meaningful ways, into their school wellness policies from the, from the state level. And so there might be uh, places to look for ideas. Um, so our session was um, the one breakout session that really focused specifically on the family child care setting. So um, in terms of what we um, kind of came out with as our recommendations, uh, the first one is really focusing on the need and opportunity to network um, and collaborate, get collaboration happen, happening amongst the family child care providers. Mm -hmm. And that this is an opportunity that as funders, as organizations already working in your states or nationally that you can really do. It is gonna look different in every state, how you can kind of pull those groups together. But there are existing groups that you can leverage who already have this existing relationship with the family child care providers. So you might be looking at something like uh, uh, the CCRNR network. You might be looking at things like the CACFP sponsor groups. Uh, it might be cooperative extension. There might be a number of different existing infrastructure that you can leverage who have these relationships already, but really the networking is critical and the myth that these child care, uh, family child care providers uh, don't have time or aren't gonna wanna connect. Uh, I think uh, um, a, a great comment from the session was they're around little kids all day. Right? <laughs> so we, they want to get together, share information, talk to adults, which sounds awesome. Um, the second is really this differentiation of family child care as a business, and one that they want to be um, understood as a different type of business from center care. 
Um, and so while we can use materials that are uh, created for center care, they really, really need to be not like handing over center care materials, center-based care materials, and saying, here, use this, figure it out. That it's really, how can we tailor materials specific to family child care, and that each family child care is going to look a little bit different. So um, understanding that differentiation, but also the fact that what can bring these folks to the table in terms of really buying into this to the interventions are the bottom line. So will this uh, you know, be better business practice for you can often kind of help step into some of those tailored uh, interventions. And then um, a concern area and an area for um, a lot of work and a lot of um, concerted effort is really the health of the family child care provider. Mm -hmm. So we're looking at trying to address the health of children, but um, if you're looking at the actual health of the family child care providers, um, it's really, really difficult when they're dealing with their own health issues to be good role models for the children within their care. So looking at strategic interventions focused specifically on the health provider to therefore affect the health of the children. So those are three recommendations. Fantastic. Thank you. We really have two general areas of call to action. Um, one that I think uh, is important for, for, for all of us to really take a look at assessing our own personal views of racial equity. Mm. Going beyond the personal look, we had some conversation too about looking at your organization, um, looking at institutional views and, and those unintended consequences that can come when you bring biases to the table. Um, there was a lot of uh, conversation about making sure we have families included, that we have staff included, um, what is the role of leadership. And a salient point for me was that there, were some, there was some discussion about what was happening at institutional levels and that it was being done behind closed doors, so to speak, because they were internal to conversations, internal to organizations. Um, and one of the participants made the comment that you know, we really need to be able to talk about that um, out loud, that it's really important for us to acknowledge that these are issues that we do need to discuss and um, we need to create environments where it's safe to have these very difficult conversations. The second uh, action item I'm going to put under what we agreed to call one size does not fit all that when we're working with staff, with families, um, that we remember that it's important to target our efforts. And that can look like choosing a geographical area. That was one of our presenters really talked about uh, the way the organization focused on the area of greatest need. Um, we can talk about targeting recruitment efforts for the folks who work within our organizations to ensure that we have diversity of um, thought, diversity of practice. We talked about the fact that it can be something as basic as making sure applications are in the language, native language of the families we serve, or that you have a list of foods that are creditable through the USDA food program because families don't quite understand that the foods of their culture are OK. Um, that we consider things like small business training and that perspective that can be brought to the table to really help work with our staff um, and with our families. And that uh, there are a lot of survey tools out there that we can use as we begin to look at those targeted efforts. Wow. So there's like, you know, a significant set. There's 18 really good ideas and they cross the policy, the practice, and the research. So kudos to everybody. Some really good work and excellent um, synthesis by the facilitators. Thank you very much.